Hello everybody and welcome to Science Appliance, where we apply the science. Today I am solving the gravestone ending in FNAF 100%. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to run you through absolutely everything you need to know about the gravestones, because I believe that I have figured everything out. So make sure to like and subscribe for more FNAF videos like this. And let's get on with today's MEGA THEORY! The Gravestone Ending Also known as the Law Keeper Ending, which to me means that solving these gravestones will complete a large chunk of the FNAF law. And it does! Hear me out, I'm going to tell you who I think every single gravestone is for. Firstly, the background gravestone is Charlie, or the puppet. Gabriel is missing child number one or Freddy, Fritz is missing child number 2, the bite victim and Foxy, Susie is missing child number 3, the fruity maze girl and Chica, Jeremy is missing child number 4 and Bonnie, and the final gravestone is Michael Brooks, missing child number 5 and Golden Freddy. Now although I haven't presented any evidence to you thus far, this theory already looks clean right? If you were to pick the main six animatronics present in FNAF, you would most likely pick Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, Golden Freddy, and the Puppet. And so, this theory just makes sense. Another reason it makes sense is because all of them were dead and buried in the same year, 1983. Let me present you the evidence that backs up this entire claim. Firstly, let's have a look at our dear friend Charlie, whose name I believe to be imprinted on the gravestone at the back of the scene. Now, why she is away from the others is because she isn't related to the others in any large ways. The ones in the foreground, as you will discover, are, the, are all victims of the missing children incident that happened in 1983. However, Charlie was killed at the very first Fazbear location. Specifically, the one that we play as, the, the one that we play in, in Five Nights at Freddy's 6. There are two places where we see Charlie die, and the first one is in the Take Cake to the Children minigame. We see Freddy taking cake to six children inside the establishment walls, whilst Charlie stands outside the door, looking in. This establishment, although small and containing one animatronic, cannot possibly be Fredbear's family diner because the Freddy inside the establishment is clearly a Freddy Fazbear suit, which was not an animatronic present in Fredbear's family diner. Also, the puppet jump scare happens after the minigame, symbolising that the child here becomes the puppet, which was also an animatronic, never found in Fredbear's family diner. There's a lot of evidence pointing to this place being the same as everywhere seen in the main nights of FNAF 6, the pizzeria simulator of FNAF 6, and the security puppet minigame in FNAF 6. One bold piece of evidence is simply the Freddy. The teasers on Scott's website before the game came out were of this exact same sprite, running with rainbows behind him. That to me says that this minigame and FNAF 6 are linked. Also, the two children who die in both minigames of the TCTTC minigame and the puppet minigame die in very similar ways. We don't see it happen in the most recent one, but we do see tire tracks, symbolising that a car had pulled up in this place quite recently, just like the purple car in the other minigame. The puppet is then seen taking her remnant, and remembering the face of William Afton ready to get revenge later. Believe it or not, this was William Afton's first ever kill in the timeline. I can tell because every other murder he performs is told to us. I can tell because every other murder he performs is told to us happens in a yellow spring bonnie suit, and it wouldn't make sense for him to just reveal his identity after murdering in a suit multiple times, just, just like that. This is also the only murder outside of the walls of an establishment, meaning that it must be his first kill. So, we have a child stood outside of the first Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, who gets killed after Purple Guy pulls up in his car and takes her life. Her soul energy or remnant is taken from the puppet, a child protector inside of the establishment like we see in FNAF 6 as the security puppet. Now that we have that story cleared up, 
How do we know that this is Charlie? Well, although this name is only present in the books, we know that she is Henry's daughter, so we can draw some parallels to the games. In FNAF 6's ending speech, we know that Henry is talking because he says, Don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. Implying that this old friend he is talking to has satanic connotations, and that obviously he's an old friend. This must refer to William Afton, as Scraptrap also appears on the screen at the same time as he says this. And we know that they were both co-owners, so they must have, must have been mates at some time. In the same speech, Henry talks about his daughter, whilst the screen displays both minigames, saying all three are connected. And who is Henry's daughter? None other than Charlie herself. So, when does this all take place? Because she is the first victim of Purple Guy and it takes place in a very early establishment. Well, although it sounds anticlimactic, it has to take place during 1983, because Charlie's gravestone in the books says 1980 to 1983. Now I know what you're thinking, this literally messes everything up and creates intertwining wormholes between the universes of the books and the games, however, it all makes sense. It's easy to tell that this child was young when she died, and I would say that 3 is a minimum age in this situation. The girl even has to jump to see through the window properly, so yes, she has to be pretty young. Also, have you ever contemplated why this girl is the only child with a green band, and why the puppet is only aiming towards the green band? I hadn't before this either, but what if it was because of her age? It would, meant, it would make sense for a puppet to block certain children from leaving the pizzeria because of their youth. The other children are a little older, so they don't need to be protected from running out onto the road. So, I think that it is safe to say that 3 is an appropriate age for this child to be at the time. However, you're probably thinking that it would mean that she must be under 3 years of age during the events of the books. And to that I say, she isn't alive during the books. Yeah, you heard me right. Miss Charlie over here is long gone dead when she is a teenager. In fact, the mind-blowing revelation that was made during the fourth closet spoilers was the fact that Charlie has and always will be a robot ever since when she died at three. There's also a little bit of confusion with cloning her into Elizabeth and Sammy being someone important, whatever, but we don't need to talk about that today. Anyway, every way to Sunday does the evidence point to this being Charlie, and this all taking place in the year of 1983. So, to clarify once more, why do I think that this grave is Charlie's grave? Well, we know that from the book that the grave says Charlotte Emily which is a significantly longer name than the others also seen on the gravestone at the back. And as I said before, she was not part of the missing children incident, therefore she's away from the other grave to show a clear difference in the way that they died. One down, five to go. I'm going to stick around with the easier ones first so that it's easier to convince you that my theory is correct later down the line. <sighs> I am already tired of speaking. Anyway, next up is going to be Susie, who, if you've watched my Fruity Maze minigame theory, is nowadays a very easy character to explain. However, I'm going to go through the main theory that we went through in the video so that you're caught up. In the fourth closet, it's confirmed that there's a character called Susie, who is seen wearing a red bow and having blonde locks of hair that bounce up and down as she runs. We've picked out that this is very similar to both the girl we see every time we get more time in the maze and the girl you play as in the maze, whose hair does actually bounce up and down. Therefore we can imply that this is and forever will be Susie from in the books. Another detail that supports this is the fact that in the books she has a dead dog and in minigames third iteration we see a dog completely and utterly dead. Another similarity we've talked about is the fact that the book has a mirror maze inside of it, similar to the green maze seen in the minigame. However, this information alone does not explain the full content of 
the Fruity Maze minigame. Let's take this step by step. Firstly, we know that this has to take place in 1983 because William is inside of a Spring Bonnie costume and Spring Bonnie appears in the maze as what Susie in the books calls as her friend. Of course, there's no way that she could call the suit her friend unless she had met it before. Therefore, this provides us with two pieces of information. Firstly, Susie isn't crying because of the Spring Bonnie behind her, as many were assuming. And secondly, it must take place in 1983, due to the fact that after the bite of 83, and more on that later, Fred Bears was closed down and the suits were left alone for a couple of years. Now, you'll see that as the minigame progresses, items change, the face changes, and the music changes, signifying that something has happened between the iterations of the game. I can understand that the order that they occur in is the chronological order of the events, as Susie is seen happy, like every other element in the maze, which turns to her feeling sad and crying, like every other element in the final iteration. So what is she crying about? Well, we have to take into account everything shown on the screen, including things that you don't normally look at in the game. Turns out there's actually an image laid on top of the actual play. Uh, the playable game, looking like the screen of an arcade game, so maybe this is playing, this is being played by Susie at an arcade game. Maybe in fact we are playing as Susie, because as things flash on the screen, you can see her reflection of her face on the screen. We know that this is a reflection due to the lighting on the faces of the two characters. So we know that everything that we can see is everything that Susie can see and so she does see a dead dog in the game instead of an orange. Why? Well, probably because she's having flashbacks to when a dog recently died. This, of course, makes her cry, and William is there ready to kill her weak, innocent, and defenseless. It is unknown how her dog died, probably by a car. However, we can tell this will be a missing children murder because William is dressed in a spring bonnie suit and due to the text of the end he pulls her into being led to the back of the pizzeria where all of the children get killed. To clarify a little further, Susie sees a dead dog, flowers and a shoebox because the more she thinks about the incident, the more she remembers about putting the dog into the shoebox and putting down flowers on the dog's grave. Also, the fact that she's trapped in a maze is metaphorical for the psychological and physical elements of Susie at this point in time. Psychologically, she's trapped in a maze because she can't escape the feelings she gets due to her dog being dead, and physically because Spring Bonnie is now here to trap her and to kill her. This, by the way, is most likely taking place in a Freddy Fazbear's Pizza establishment as there are arcade games and who the hell has arcade games in a diner? Also, I have a feeling that the dog's death had something to do with Freddy Fazbear's, as a fruity maze alone cannot just trigger Susie's emotions that quickly. Therefore, the interpretation of the fruity maze minigame is that Susie was in a pizzeria, weak and innocent due to the memories of her dead dog, and William inside a spring bonnie costume lured her to the back room of the establishment to kill her. This makes her a victim of the missing children incident. And that means with two done, we still have four to go, which are probably not going to be in as much detail as they are harder to master and talk about. That's no exception for Fritz. Fritz is a name that we've seen before on the final night of FNAF 2 as the Night Guard. However, not everything is that easy to put together in this one. For example, at first I was convinced that it was the FNAF 4 Foxy Bully, however, now I fully believe that it's the crying child. Hear me out, 1983 was when this bite occurred, however, he didn't die from the incident. He died from the same way as every other missing, children di as every other missing child died, by being lured to the back room and by being killed by a spring bonnie. Therefore, his remnant doesn't go into Golden Freddy as many theorists believe, however it goes into Foxy. Let me explain everything to do with the bite. What bite incident is this showing? Well although first believed to be the bite of 87, Scott retconned this in sister location to display that it took place in 1983, also known as the bite of 83. 
As we see in the minigame, the foxy mast bully throws the crying child into Fredbear's mouth and with one bite, crying child is sent off to hospital as shown by the flowers, pills and IV easter eggs in FNAF 4. However, he doesn't die, but a lot of brain damage occurs, making him weak. See the connection between the two children? William picks weak children. He picked Susie because she was in a tough emotional state, and he chose Fritz because he was in a bad physical state. It's a little, in fact, very weird to say that the father killed his very own son. However, don't forget that he didn't hurt him in the first place. Oh, and I forgot to tell you why I think that the crying child is Fritz. The main reason, and the only reason I'm saying this, is because in the fourth closet, there's a boy named Fritz, with a striped shirt on. Which is, again, a weird detail, until you consider the fact that Crying Child is the only kid in the games with a striped shirt. That's half of them complete, and by now you're probably noticing that everything is fitting together, happening in 1983. Including Charlie, not a missing child. However, now we turn to the obscure bunch. That's what I'm calling them from now on. I'm going to turn over to Michael Brooks from the books, who I believe to be buried under this gravestone covered by grass. The person who inherits this gravestone must be somebody quite obvious, and by simply putting Michael on it, people may get confused with Michael Afton as opposed to Michael Brooks, which is why I think Scott covered it in grass. If you aren't caught up with the books, like me, I'm uncultured. It is confirmed that this is the name of the first person to be kidnapped by someone in a yellow suit and killed in the back of a pizzeria. This again is William Afton, but it's com but it's also com yeah, but it is also confirmed that he was looking at a Golden Freddy suit at the time, the animatronic that contains the remnant of Michael. The full proof that Michael is in that suit. It's because of a time when a group of teenagers confront the animatronics and see that Michael is inside of a yellow suit with the appearance of Freddy. Therefore, Golden Freddy is Michael Brooks. And believe it or not, that's it for Michael. You only need to know that he was the first missing child and his remnant is redeemed by Golden Freddy. And so, that leaves two. Two that are incredibly vague and literally impossible to work out at this moment in time. However, they must be part of the missing children incident as that's what ties all the front children together. We don't have any information about either of the characters, so these two are just going to be pure guesswork until we get FNAF 7 or Ultimate Custom Night or maybe the missing pages of the fourth closet. That's everyone in the gravestone ending, but there's more. Remember the FNAF 3 ending? Well, as I've said multiple times in other videos, I think that the two endings are connected. Look at the head positions, look at the gravestone positions. If we relate them, that means Gabriel is Freddy, Fritz is Foxy, Susie is Chica, Jeremy is Bonnie, and Michael is Golden Freddy. And based off of what I said, most of them we know to be true. And of course the puppet is away from the others, like how she isn't in the FNAF 3 ending. And that is what makes FNAF, FNAF. The original five animatronics and the puppet just like what we see in the Happiest Day minigame, where all of the children's souls are celebrating together. Everyone is there, the missing children and the puppet, who put the bodies in the suits in the first place. That to me is really satisfying as an ending. If I was Scott making the last game of a series, I would put everyone together that sums up FNAF. So what do you believe in? Please tell me in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this. Uh, th yeah, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all later. I don't know why I said it like that, but I'll see you later anyway. Goodbye!